Okay. Um, this is uh, this is going to be, uh, I think, a, an excellent panel. Um, we have three experts uh, who will be approaching the topic from different points of view. Uh, we're going to go uh, alphabetically, so we'll begin with uh, with Peter Hakem. Perhaps we can just start with the. Uh, we can just, I think, do this seated, and uh, we'll go one, two, three. Uh, a chance to to uh, then discuss among themselves, uh, and then uh, we'll go into the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I get the most time, right, going first? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let me say that uh, one thing unequal partners may describe the U.S.-Mexican relationship, they also describe this panel. I have two real Mexico experts, uh, and, uh, and me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, we all know how many books Sid Weintraub, where is Sid? There he is, <laughs> uh, has written. And uh, the first one I wrote, read of his, and I couldn't help uh, remembering it when I began reading this book, was A Marriage of Convenience. And now it's ended up as Unequal Partners. Uh, it's no reflection <laughs> on Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, the question is, what's the next book, Sid? If it's mar marriage of convenience, unequal partners, where does it go next? What would? And another question I would have, Sid, and this is a little bit of an uncoordinated ramble, you'll notice. Um, was this all inevitable, Sid? In other words, uh, I remember your book, Marriage of Convenience, your writings on the pre-NAFTA that were very optimistic. Even post-NAFTA were very optimistic. This book sounds uh, as if it's the most critical I've read. Uh, and uh, uh, I just wondered if there is a change in your own thinking about the uh, kind, the quality, the uh, direction of the relationship. Uh, um, let, me, let me just say also, let me not get into the criticism right away, that it is a as uh, both Carla and uh, Ambassador Jones suggested, the uh, book is an incredible guide to the policy issues uh, that separate and join uh, both Mexico and the United States. It really goes through the important issues. It lays out in very clear form the issues, arguments, choices, consequences, and. I thought that uh, I was once on a debate club, and you know, if I needed a book that would inform me of how to debate either side of the argument on Mexico, so this would this would provide it. Uh, it really is a very extraordinary sort of uh, map through the landscape of, of issues and problems. I have one small disagreement, Sid, uh, only, and and. Uh, that is, I'm not sure uh, that I agree with your thesis that this is a relationship of dependency. And uh, to me, dominance and dependency, dominance means uh, you get your way. And the United States is not getting its way on many issues. Uh, uh, Mexico may not be doing it by sort of taking an equal uh, I think the, the title unequal partners is right, but I think the uh, way that the relationship evolves is more, uh, maybe the word, is there a word, obstinacy, stubbornness, uh, resistance, rather than dependency. I'm not quite sure I would, I would use that word, but maybe, uh, and indeed if there was a better word, it's almost that, that what comes to mind, and I'm not sure there is a single word, is dysfunctional. Uh, almost counterproductive at, at times. Uh, let me say, uh, if uh, you brought together, you know, a panel of uh, experts on these various issues, uh, uh, let's say from anywhere that knew very little about Mexico to start with, they could come from, you know, Nigeria, Australia, uh, Russia, Mars, uh, I think if you laid out the set of problems that Sid discusses in the book, they would come to pretty similar conclusions uh, about what has to get done. In fact, Sid himself points to the direction. 
why is it that uh, the U.S. and Mexico seem to have such a great difficulty in sort of moving along a track toward problem solving? And in some ways, it seems to me it's almost the, the very uh, nature of the and history of the relationship that of, uh, prevents effective problem solving, uh, uh, prevents effective mutual cooperation, uh, and, you know, one can take any one of the issues and, uh, you know, take oil, for example, just, uh, you know, we all see Mexico is really not making good productive use of its incredible oil resources, and uh, it's even allowing them to sort of decline, and it's not replenishing them, and, uh, and also, not only that, but it's allowing it to really uh, uh, undermine or its, its fiscal uh, management as well. Uh, and Mexico seems unable to take advantage of what the U.S. could really provide, technology, investment capital. And the reason it doesn't take advantage of that is precisely embedded in the history of the relationship. And sort of can we overcome that history? And that's when I say dysfunctional, that the history and the process of the relationship almost makes it impossible. One can go on to sort of drugs and violence, and I'm gonna stop, stop here. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, Ambassador Jones mentioned her trip, which was a great success in Mexico, where she talks about the need for co-responsibility, the co, uh, uh, effort by the United States. And then she mentions two uh, issues on which the United States can be helpful, which was very appealing to the Mexicans. One, we would reduce our uh, consumption of, of drugs. And secondly, we would reduce the uh, uh, smuggling of arms to Mexico. And the fact is that looking at those on its face, knowing what we know about American politics, we recognize how impossible it is to move very quickly on either of those issues in this country. And so, you know, what appeals, what made her trip so successful were precisely a speech where she was enunciating objectives that were almost impossible to achieve. Uh, and I could go on and on about Mexico's not being willing to take advantage of U.S. law enforcement capabilities and the like. And then, of course, we could move into immigration if one really wants to take a dysfunctional uh, or, or to sort of illustrate a dysfunctional relationship. But I'm going to leave that up to who's H.O. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Antonio Ortiz. Well, let me congratulate Sid on a great book. Okay. Thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you, uh, Sid, for inviting me. I don't know if, if uh, my wife should be here. She's a clinical psychologist, and she's speaking about uh, uh, dysfunctional relationships, marriages of convenience, and things like that. But since, since she's not here, uh, I'll make some uh, comments. Uh, on a personal basis, not in my capacity as an embassy of uh, Mexico uh, official. And first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate Sydney uh, on the book. Again, I'm astounded by the uh, productivity of Sydney. In my uh, previous incarnation, I was the chair of an academic department in Mexico, and it was a tourism that once uh, someone got tenure, they stopped uh, producing because of you know, moral hazard issues. I don't know if the Cuernavaca air or what makes you uh, keep ticking, so uh, if you have any secrets, please uh, share them. Uh, Sid. Now, on the, uh, on the book, I would say that it's a, a, a very comprehensive book, even though it's uh, fairly uh, slim in size. It's uh, you know, readable. It covers a wide array of uh, issue areas that Ambassador Hills has uh, mentioned, and I think this is very important. To understand Mexico these days, my, you may need to analytically separate those issue areas, but there's no way you can understand trade without understanding investment, without understanding energy, without uh, understanding uh, transnational organized crime border issues. It's a, it's a complex relationship, and I think that uh, Sydney does a wonderful job of laying out these separate strands and then putting them uh, back together uh, at the end of the book when he makes uh, uh, some uh, proposals. Uh, 
my sense is that the take home point of the book is that uh, change is possible. Uh, if I think back when I was in, uh, in uh, school in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and I read uh, Unequal Partners, I would think dependency, dependency theory, you know, structuralism, there's no way you can deal with the U.S. Uh, except, except by uh, delinking, decoupling uh, fr from the U.S. And uh, where, where I was uh, based at, at CIDA in the... I wasn't based there in the early 70s, but my uh, predecessors were. And a lot of them refused uh, to study the US. They said, you know, you combat the enemy. You don't study the enemy. But luckily, we had some uh, political exiles from Argentina, from Chile, from Uruguay that knew what they were talking about. And they said, no, we're happy to take grants from the Ford Foundation and to understand how the US Congress works and how US makes uh, domestic policy and, and foreign policy. I think that was uh, very uh, uh, enlightened. And it also uh, goes to show that you know, individuals matter and that they can change uh, policies. Now, um, how did a more uh, sort of proactive uh, stance from Mexico come about in some of the issue areas that Sid mentions, trade, FDI, uh, maybe energy? Uh, I would say that in terms of trade, it was a, a crisis-led policy change. Uh, ISI uh, was not working, and we had the debt crisis in the 1980s, and you know, uh, when we exhausted a lot of options, we decided to join GATT. After in 79, we decided we would not uh, join uh, GATT. But I think this was a, a pretty centralized uh, decision by uh, the president and his uh, advisors. Uh, same with... Uh, same with FDI. When um, FDI was um, highly regulated under the Echeverria administration, uh, that was a decision made by Echeverria and a small group of advisors. When FDI was subsequently uh, opened in the uh, 1980s with uh, De La Madrid and later on with Salinas, it was, I mean, nobody asked me, uh, or a lot of other Mexicans, it was a, a, a decision by an elite uh, by a, an elite group. And I, I believe that things are changing uh, in Mexico, but it, it's still very difficult to get a good degree of accountability from decision makers. Um, I think that in order to have a more functional uh, relationship, as opposed to a dysfunctional uh, relationship, uh, we need uh, greater uh, accountability, both from uh, you know, uh, business leaders and uh, political uh, leaders, and I think that until we push through some very important political reforms in Mexico, starting with re-election uh, for members of uh, our Congress, it'll be very difficult to have a more uh, proactive, a more uh, long-term view about how to do the things we need to do uh, to make the most out of the uh, relationship with the U.S. and the fact that we are joined at the hip and it's, you know, I don't think that we want surgery. I don't think that you can have surgery. I mean, we're stuck. Uh, we're stuck uh, with each other. And I would uh, end with a uh, question uh, for, for uh, Sydney. What do you think it would take for U.S. leaders uh, to change the dynamic of relationship? I think this is an interesting book written by, by a U.S. A former diplomat, a, a, a U.S. academic looking at things maybe from, uh, from a Mexican perspective, in a way. I think it would be interesting to, I don't know, to have a Mexican or someone uh, look at, at this uh, dysfunctional or complex relationship from a US uh, perspective. What would it take for US leaders, both in government and in uh, business and, and civil society, to change this uh, dominant dependent relationship or, or dysfunctional uh, relationship? And I'll leave that to Sid. Thank you. Thanks very much, Antonio. Um, Andrew? Thank you, Peter. Um, you know, first of all, congratulations to Sydney on a very fine book. Um, this is really, it's, it's, a, it's an easy book to read, and I think it's incredibly insightful and incredibly timely. Um, I, I showed this book to a, a colleague at, over at the Wilson Center the other day when it, when it came out, and her first comment, she looked over on the other side and noticed that I had a comment on the back of the book and said, shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't it be Sidney Weintraub commenting on something that you have, have written and not you commenting on Sidney Weintraub? And I feel somewhat both honored but also slightly intimidated to, to comment on that. On Sidney's latest book. 
Um, I, in fact, there's very little written on the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Right? And that's something that's a great deal in the U.S. written on Mexico, um, surprisingly little on the U.S.-Mexico relationship. And, that, and that's true in Mexico as well. I mean, there's relatively little, given the importance the relationship has for, for both of us, for both countries, how little scholarship there is. And, and Sydney has really been at the forefront for, for many years um, driving this scholarship. In fact, I was doing a literature review the other day on, on U.S.-Mexico relations, and English language literature, I mean, I'm pulling numbers out of the air, but probably, you know, a quarter, a third of, of the good scholarship on U.S.-Mexico relations must have been written by Sidney Weintraub. And that, that is rather surprising, actually. So it is, um, once again, we see, you know, his, his latest updating of where things are as things in the relationship have moved. And I think it's particularly timely for, for reasons that I'll get to, to in a moment. Um, Clearly, asymmetry is, is a major feature of the relationship. When you ask people who know, who follow U.S.-Mexico relations, it's sort of the first thing that comes off the lip. That's not surprising. I mean, probably nowhere in the world is there a, a developed country and a developing country that share such an intense relationship, such a long border between them. Countries, you know, the U.S. is three times the size of Mexico. GDP per capita is, is roughly six times, depending how you calculate it. You know, 18 times difference uh, in... in ratio in, in uh, the GDP between the two countries. It's a significant difference. It, it's not surprising that asymmetry would be a major feature. But as Sidney points out in this book, you know, it's not only the fact that, that asymmetry exists, which is not surprising, but the way it's internalized and the way that it shapes policymaking. You can do lots of things with asymmetry. So the question is, how do we on each side of the border deal with this? And I, and I think Antonio's right. To, to a large extent, you know, this book is almost going to be more useful to people on the Mexican side than on the U.S. side. To, to some extent, it, it is a book about how Mexico can change the dynamic. But that's probably not surprising in, in any asymmetrical relationship. The, the one on, on, the, the, um, on, on the weaker side of the relationship often is the one in the position to change terms, the one that has the incentive to change things. And, and I think, as he shows in this book, has historically been the one that has changed what asymmetry means. Um, a little bit of history, and this is borrowing from our, our mutual friend Peter Smith. Um, you know, the U.S. to a large extent has conditioned the relationship with Mexico through history, through I its general foreign policy. I mean, originally looking at the acquiring of territory, um, then moving into questions of investment and, and spheres of economic control, early part of the 20th century. And then post-war, post-World War II, the Cold War really conditioned U.S. policy towards Mexico. And Ambassador Jones referred to that as well. I mean, we largely saw Mexico through the lens of stability, through keeping it out of the, the orbit um, of the communist bloc. Um, Sergio Guayo and Jacqueline Mas have written a pair of books, both done here at SICE, actually, um, that, that looked at how that conditioned U.S. support for a single-party system in Mexico, for example. But largely our lens was stability. Stability and, you know, Mexico can have an independent foreign policy on Cuba as long as, as Mexico is sharing information on Cuba as well. Um, and, and Mexico, in return, ha developed a foreign policy that was largely defensive, that largely sought to maintain a degree of autonomy, a degree of, of independence against a very strong neighbor that had a very specific interest. Um, <clears throat> This changed after the, the Cold War. And the, the Cold War, you know, as Peter Smith notes and Sidney, you know, implies here as well, the post-war period is a period where there is no single framework for U.S. foreign policy, where other issues, often real issues of economic interest, um, security, you know, drug trafficking, democratization, a few other things float up, but there is no single framework. And, and to some extent, it, it has left U.S. policy towards Latin America being somewhat rudderless. I mean, I think many of us that follow Latin America would say it's often unclear what the framework where Latin America fits into broader U.S. <laughs> foreign policy interests. But the inverse has actually happened with Mexico. And, and the inverse has happened because this is a period that's coincided with, with an intensification, with a growing interdependence between the U.S. and Mexico in very real terms. Um, and, and this will sound almost like the chapters of the book, actually. I mean, in fact, tracks completely along there. I mean, trade, clearly Mexico becomes fundamentally important for the United States in terms of trade, in terms of economic development. Uh, becomes incredibly important in terms of migration, where almost one in 10 Americans is of Mexican heritage today. Almost one in 10 Mexicans lives in the United States. Actually, more than one in 10 Mexicans lives in the United States. Where the border develops, border cities, border communities develop in importance, but also the border is pushed back gradually, where you can talk about cities like Dallas and Phoenix and Los Angeles, or Monterrey and Hermosillo and Ensenada becoming border cities. Um, and, and so what is the area of, of really intense interaction at the border um, is much more significant. And we're drug trafficking, the illicit side of the trading relationship between our countries becomes significantly important, both as a public health issue, but also in, in the past couple of years, grabs people's attention because of, of the level of violence. 
Um, this is a period in the post-Cold War where we, we no longer have a single foreign policy framework, but we develop a set of interdomestic issues and intensity in the relationship that leads to a great interdependence between us. And, and it is also a period where there's a rise of, of new actors, a greater complexity in the relationship, where it is no longer just the State Department and the Relaciones Exteriores managing the relationship, but you begin to see in the middle of an economic crisis like last year where the Treasury Departments of the two countries are, are really the lead where you begin to see on the drug trafficking issue, it, it is not, yes, the State Department and, and the Foreign Ministry play a huge role in setting the framework for understanding, but the actual operative work on the ground is the Justice Department, Homeland Security on this side, as well as other agencies on the Mexican side, it's Gobernación, Seguridad Pública, and others, where you see Congress has become increasingly important. And, and democratization in Mexico is fundamental here as well, obviously, in the same period, where Congress becomes a, a very important actor in Mexico as it becomes in the United States, and they begin to develop their own set of interactions that don't flow through the executive branch, where you see border governors becoming important actors, border legislators, attorney generals, um, local mayors, and you begin to see people other than outside of government becoming important actors in the relationship, labor and business and others. So we have, at, at one hand, the loss of a single framework for understanding the relationship, but the growth of a set of interests that are very real, that touch on domestic interests in our two countries, and that have a whole set of actors around them who often think, of, think about these issues in completely different ways. Um, this goes back to, to Sidney's book because I think the story he is telling us is though that the relationship is deeply asymmetrical. When you look at specific issue areas, it's much less asymmetrical. Um, the relationship as a whole, if you look at it, you know, if you say, is this a very uneven relationship? Is the U.S. a much bigger country, more economically influential, a, a sort of world superpower? Yeah. If you look at a specific issue like trade, if you look at a specific issue like drug trafficking, if you look at a specific issue like managing a relationship between Tijuana and San Diego, and economic complementarities at the border, it becomes a much more equal relationship. It becomes, and it becomes a relationship in, there, in which there are multiple actors who have different views of things and are often building alliances that do not um, divide easily as simply a U.S. position and a Mexican position. And I think Sydney's captured that very well by looking at the major issues in the relationship. When you actually look at these, in fact, the relationship becomes much less asymmetrical in terms of how it plays out. And let me just end with, with two questions for Sydney. I think there's, there's two areas that, that he touches on that, that I think can be explored further. And these are perhaps limitations to where the relationship can become less asymmetrical over time. Because to a large extent, I think this is an argument about how, yes, it's asymmetrical, but how it can become less asymmetrical over time, and particularly how Mexico can drive this becoming less asymmetrical. W one is to what extent um, can Mexico reposition itself I in the world? Um, Mexico has, has, some would say, punched under its weight in terms of global politics, has tended to, to be somewhat hesitant in engaging in, in international discussions. That, that is starting to change perhaps with climate change and a few other areas. But to what extent can Mexico actually strengthen its position vis-a-vis -vis the United States by having a more active position vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the world as well and, and other major global issues? And secondly, one that you do touch on in here but, but would love to hear your thoughts on more is to what extent to, to change the underlying question of asymmetry? And asymmetry will never go away because of different population sizes, different, different places in the world, world economy. But to what, extents, to what extent could, I mean, the story you're telling about asymmetry, the real way of changing this over time is investing in, in development in Mexico, in Mexico investing in its own development. And to what extent may this at some point become a detonator? I mean, to, to the extent that it's very hard to reach consensus in a new democracy in Mexico, around economic policy, around social policy, to what extent the desire to actually have a stronger role vis-a-vis -vis the United States to be, may actually be something that drives consensus, much as it has for Brazil. I mean, Bra Brazilians can, can tear each other apart about, internally among a number of issues, but when it gets to Brazil's role in the world, Brazilians unite. And, and that's led to a certain consensus around some bases for economic and social policy. And I'm wondering if that may happen in the case of Mexico as well, particularly seeing you know, that this, this presents a co consistent weakness vis-a-vis -vis the United States. This may be a driver at some point to, to try and deal with any symmetry um, by, by getting the, the domestic house in order as well. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much to our, to our three panelists. Uh, all of you have raised questions that are very basic to uh, to Sid's book, and uh, and perhaps uh, uh, it would be useful now for uh, 
for Dr. Weintraub to address uh, some of those questions. Uh, we heard uh, Peter, Peter Hakem uh, expressing his sense that the tone of the book is more critical than in the past, less optimistic. Um, is this a change in thinking? Uh, Antonio uh, mentioned or raised the question of what it would take for the United States to really begin to change uh, its positions on Mexico. Andrew questions about how, what, to what extent can Mexico reposi uh, reposition itself in the world to strengthen its own position and deal with the question of asymmetry. Other questions as well. Um, Sid, why don't you, you want to take them on? I'll be brief on these, and then I, I hope we give the audience a chance. I'll go in order, although they disagree with each other. So if I answer, I answer some of the questions that Peter Hakem uh, gave, they will disagree. Other people didn't necessarily agree. Uh, and I'll point out where, where there are differences, maybe. Uh, uh, I think the word dysfunctional is a lousy word. Uh, I hate to say that. Uh, because there have been so much working together, it has not been impossible to change Mexican policy. That's at the heart of the book. When something happened in 1982, when the debt crisis uh, came, they changed on a dime. The policy. Uh, the po can you hear me? Okay. The policy did change. It changed quite radically, and it changed overnight. It, it, the U.S. is a, a lot slower in changing, and I'll come back to, uh, I'll come back to the decision. Uh, the, uh, some things, in other words, the idea that it's impossible to change has been disproven by facts. I give, I give some other examples in the book. In the 1994, uh, exchange rate crisis, really, and then the 1995 uh, depression in, uh, in Mexico. Overnight, even against their will, the Mexicans changed from a, a fixed rate. It was, a, it was, it was a, a spread between the upper and lower bounds of that, uh, of that fixed rate. They changed to a floating rate. In other words, it's not impossible to change. When, when, when the circumstances change, Mexico has been more able to change uh, quickly than the United States has been. Uh, and that impressed me, and that's one of, my, one of the main conclusions I reached, and it's a, it's a question asked by Antonio, uh, and I want to come to that, why Mexico is more able to change uh, than the United States. Uh, And I guess it's in part, we're a bigger country, we, we're somewhat more arrogant, we're somewhat, somewhat more sure of the fact that we're right about things. And I think that probably gets into it very much. Uh, you know, why should we change? We're the strong guy. They're the weaker guy. They should change. It's a lousy policy to follow <laughs> for the United States. But we do that frequently. Uh, and he asked, how could we change? How could we change on a lot of things? Uh, uh, you know, uh, trucking is one example, for example, that was raised by uh, Carla. I think the fact that the U.S. Congress and the President's willingness to sign a bill which cut off the special arrangement on trucking was about one of the most deplorable things I've ever seen. And the Congress did it, and the President did it, because they assumed Mexico was so docile, they had been for the 10 previous years, they wouldn't retaliate. Well, when we gave, when we told Mexico definitively, we're never going to change. That's what that legislation was. That's what that signature was. They, they retaliated. I don't know whether, whether, uh, whether Obama will deal with his labor union. That's why he did it. That's why he didn't try to uh, go back to the agreement originally signed in NAFTA. I think he may do it now. In other words, the question you asked me, Antonio, was how can we change? And I think it's up to the President of the United States, who has not paid much attention to Mexico. 
Uh, he's a little bit like Lyndon Johnson. He's willing to talk about it abstractly, but he's not paying much attention. He's not paying much attention to sort of say uh, what's happening. It was useful uh, for Hillary Clinton to give, blame ourselves a little bit for having such big consumption and, and creating Mexico's problems. We used to argue, if you look through history, that it was all Mexico's problem. The reason we have drug consumption is they couldn't stop it coming up on the border, and we punished them. We closed the border to send them a message we wanted them to stop. In other words, we were, we were, our tendency was to blame Mexico for our problems. At least that changed, but it has to change more than that. It has to change by more than that. I don't think it's easy for, for the United States to cut back on consumption. Uh, that's going to be very hard. But uh, we could have entered into Merida a lot more generously and willingly than being dragged into it. And if you read the congressional debate, you'll see that we were dragged into it. Uh, in other words, I, I think it'll take the President of the United States to change some of the weaknesses in the way we deal with Mexico. Uh, let me make one other point. Uh, in many respects, what I'm trying to describe in the book is, is not necessarily unique to just Mexico and the United States. I make the point earlier, you can look at some of the history of other neighbors uh, where there was a, a deep conflict, dominance dependency, if, which is the phrase I used. And I think the word dependency is the right one. I don't want to go into why the whole book tries to explain that, so I suggest you read it. Uh, uh, Poland and Germany were that way for a long time. And it took Germany to make a change, realize that the relationship they had built up over the years was no longer feasible in, in the modern world. Japan and Korea were like that until World War II and Korea got its independence. Those relationships have changed, not fully, but largely, and what I'm getting at is the U.S.-Mexico relationship is changing. The final question I want to deal with, two, two points that uh, Andrew, Andrew Saley made about uh, how can Mexico reposition itself. He used, the word, he used the word asymmetry all the way through. I deliberately wanted to get away from that word. It's self-evident, there's no sense writing a book that the United States is richer, more powerful than Mexico. We know all of that, and it's self-evident. The point I was getting at was not asymmetry. Why write a book about something that's self-evident? It was really that dependency-dominance relationship. Asymmetry exists between the United States and just about every other country in the world, uh, but they're not all the same. We don't treat European countries that are weaker than us in the same way that we, we treat Mexico or have treated Mexico in the past. It's a neighbor and it makes a difference. And asymmetry is the word I deliberately said exists, but it's too evident to, to really discuss except in a paragraph the way you did. Uh, and I think Mexico can strengthen itself by behaving more equal, equally on issues. It took a long time for, as I try to point out in the book, on issue after issue, Mexico wouldn't even deal with many of the issues. Mexico wouldn't even deal with trade uh, with the United States before 1982. They didn't want to. And I give some examples in a footnote of when I was asked in the State Department to, to be the uh, director of a U.S part dealing with Mexico, all the Mexicans wanted to do at that point was to make speeches why as a, as a more dependent, less developed country, we had to give them free preferences and without any reciprocity. Uh, and I point out at that time, my reaction was, well, if you want everything for nothing, why do we have to meet? <laughs> uh, we can just do it. And we did for many, many years. Uh, uh, what they could do is, uh, I think, uh, they, can, they can make themselves heard more in the world in a way like Brazil does. They, they started to do that 
in, uh, in Iraq. After all, they voted against the United States. They happened to be on the Security Council at the time. That was a very powerful example of how Mexico stopped acting as a dependent country. They said, no, you're, just, you're wrong. We're not going to vote with you. Uh, they, can, they can show their interests in many other issues that come up uh, uh, frequently. Uh, they did, they were able uh, to change their relationship. I mean, what can the United States do was a question I said the president did. In a way, President George Bush, H.W. Bush, the father, when he agreed to negotiate NAFTA, that was an effort to make a change. Uh, it was a rather big effort to make a change. I thought NAFTA, when it was when it was signed, was the most important agreement the United States had signed with Mexico since a treaty in which Mexico had to hand over uh, a good part of its territory to <coughs> the United States. I think President Bush saw it that way, too. I think he saw the political importance of that. Finally, how can they, how can they uh, make themselves more powerful in the world? Well, they join the GATT and they speak up on the GATT. That's one, one example, World Trade Organization. Uh, uh, but they were beginning now to talk up in other areas. Uh, in, other, in some, they don't. Uh, I think the initiative for more cooperation on narcotics came from Mexico. It came from Mexico. The ambassador here worked on it. It, was, it didn't happen by accident. It was a deliberate campaign by Mexico to get more cooperation from the United States rather than for the United States to preach and do zilch. Indeed, the ambassador put it that way, and that's what we were doing. In other words, I think it's happening, and that again is part of the book. It's harder to do in some area, issue areas uh, than in others. Uh, it's harder to do it on migration uh, because Really, Mexico has no right to negotiate with the United States on Mexico. They would like to, but each country determines its own immigration policy. Uh, and they try to get at that, and they've, they've, been less, they've been less insistent in recent years on that point than Vicente Fox was, for example, when he made it the, the biggest issue in the relationship. Some, some issues are very hard to deal with, uh, but I think they can speak up, uh, speak up uh, in a positive way, in a constructive way. And my guess is they're doing it in most areas, and they ought to do it more. Uh, politely, diplomatically, not in a nasty way, uh, behave in a way sometimes much more properly than we behave at times, but it can be done. And I'll take any questions anybody in the audience wants. Thanks. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, state your name and your affiliation. We'll, we'll have a microphone. Gentle, gentleman here, Norman. Norman Bailey, Institute of World Politics. Um, first of all, my congratulations to Sydney on his most recent book, and uh, I, I can comment freely on it since I haven't read it yet. Uh, in any case, uh, my question is for anybody or everybody on the panel and also for Sydney. Thank you. Can anybody explain to me something I find really mysterious? And that is, since our relationship with Colombia is actually considerably less important than our relationship with Mexico, why is it that we have, through Democratic and Republican administrations, been able to have a very productive relationship under Plan Colombia with Colombia, which has been quite remarkably successful for years, and we simply cannot do the same kind of thing uh, for Mexico. The Merida Initiative, and, and Sid uh, commented on it very briefly, uh, frankly has been an enormous disappointment to just about everybody, and I, I don't understand the reason that the one can be done and the other can't be done. Well, I'll answer first and then let the others do. We, did, we deal with Colombia in a positive way on certain things, uh, narcotics. Uh, 
uh, and indeed in part because there was a, I think part of the motivation is that there was a guerrilla movement in Colombia that made a difference to us. It was getting engaged really in narcotics trade, the FARC. That's, that's part of it. And we didn't know where that would eventually, uh, eventually go. Uh, Mexico has some uh, uh, oppositional groups, but there's not any group, any guerrilla group in Mexico uh, that's as powerful as the FARC was when, uh, when policy began to change. If there were, I think we would have acted more quickly. But at the same time, uh, you explained to me, I can't understand why a country as friendly as Colombia, which has free trade, entry of its goods into the United States anyhow, can't get the president to make a big fight really for a free trade agreement. That's the one that puzzles the hell out of me. Uh, the Mexican ambassador here uh, stated in the speech that I heard one day, if that's the way you treat your friends, why the devil be your friend? Uh, but in any event, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but I'll leave it to others. Let me, let me just, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, what Colombia was facing was really an existential threat. I mean, the government was in very serious, uh, guerrilla groups were occupying large parts of the country, security was, and um, the two examples Sid used to show that uh, the relationship couldn't be described as dysfunctional. In the case of Mexico, where they did uh, turn very quickly on a dime, uh, as Sid said, were also very close to existential. When uh, uh, Jesus Silva Herzog called and said, we can't pay our international debt in 1982, or in 1994-95, when the peso collapsed and the economy almost collapsed. Uh, that's when, yeah, and countries find it a lot easier to find common ground when uh, there is real, serious, deep, existential threats. And I, I think that much of these other issues are not quite that. Uh, Sid has just said very well that uh, Mexico is nowhere near as threatened as uh, Colombia was for so many years. Just to add, I mean, I, uh, it's natural in, in any issue, and this is the issue of the day right now for, for a lot of reasons, but I think it's going to be true of any issue that, that we deal with in the future. I mean, Mexico is, is also in a position to bargain in a different way. I mean, this is a country where, with whom we have a deep interdependence and, and vice versa. Um, we have, as Cindy points out in the book, I mean, the, there is nonetheless sort of this history of misunderstanding. We're beginning to recognize the degree of, of interdependence we have, the, the fact that both countries can push back against the other very effectively on specific issues. It no longer breaks down the relationship when we push back on each other. When we push back on one part, we can still work together on another part. But it's going to take us a while, I think, it, it, when I say a while, we're probably talking decades, before you know, we have the kind of understandings that allow us to, to work much more fluidly on the incredible complexity that we have in the relationship. So. Thank you very much. John, you question? My name is Ahmed Mir, uh, retired from the Foreign Service. I was in Mexico during the NAFTA negotiations, both under Ambassador Jones and Ambassador Negroponte, and I don't think we've ever worked harder, the United States policy, to support Mexico. But I think after that, we abandoned. It seems that obviously Iraq was one of the reasons. But the whole uh, last decade, it seems that we've only been working with Mexico on problems. Mexico is a rich country. The question is, uh, you, why is it that we have not been able to maintain our momentum? What you say, I agree with what you say. Uh, that we did work very hard to get uh, NAFTA passed. You have the, right next to you have the woman who did a lot of the key negotiating for, for NAFTA, and I, and I think they did, the negotiators did a remarkably good job on, 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 on both sides. Uh, uh, and the agreement was what it was, and its main, its main points were accomplished on trade and investment. Why we lost interest, because it was clear to all of us, indeed at the time NAFTA was approved, a lot of us said and wrote, and I think they knew that all over, and people who follow 
uh, these relationships. If it became a static agreement, it would lose its force over time. It, it, it became a static agreement, essentially. In addition to that, we signed many more free trade agreements. So the exclusivity that Mexico and, and Canada had, Israel to some extent, but that was less significant, uh, got lost. So the growth slowed down. Uh, and I suspect that what happened was is that the opponents of NAFTA, uh, mainly the labor unions, uh, I don't dislike labor, but the labor unions have been an obstructionist group on that, on trucking, and a good many other things, have never given up their fight to, uh, against, against NAFTA. Uh, and the evidence that gets pointed out by eminent think tanks is that the reason, uh, the reason Mexico's growth rates were not very great uh, uh, over the whole period of the last 25 years, uh, some of them blame it on NAFTA or post-NAFTA. They blame it on NAFTA in ways that are, I don't know you understand. Uh, uh, my, my, view, my view is a little different. I blame it on Mexico failing to take the structural things that everybody in Mexico who studies the issue uh, know. I'll come back to your question. Uh, Peter Hakem uh, uh, made the, uh, you know, I sort of made the point that uh, the book is very critical of Mexico. I don't think it is. I think it really just essentially, put it differently, it agrees with what most economists and most people who study the country from within say about themselves. In the sense, I don't think I introduce anything new in that debate because all Mexican economists have wanted things to change. Uh, what I'm talking about is the educational system, the monopolies in Mexico, uh, the labor laws that make it impossible to, to hire people. Uh, Santiago Levy just wrote a whole, whole book on that. Uh, 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 I mean, it, it's quite known. Why we didn't do it? I don't really know. I don't really know. But you would agree that we won South America because of NAFTA? We won. We wanted all of, we wanted to have free trade with all of South America. The Brazilians, really were the most responsible for killing that. Uh, I, my own view at the time, and I remember writing a note to, uh, uh, to Mac McClarty, because he had something to do with it, and saying, why don't you go ahead without Brazil? Let them go their way, and why don't we go, go our way? Well, I, I guess he and others in the government thought Brazil was too important, we shouldn't do that. Uh, I think we haven't done it because there's a lot been written in think tanks and others uh, blaming the depression in Mexico on NAFTA and blaming, blaming high unemployment in the United States on the trade agreement uh, with Mexico and Canada. Uh, and that position, uh, it's, it's not a majority in the United States, but I think NAFTA is a 50-50 proposition uh, in polls among uh, Americans as to whether they favor it or, or oppose it, I think the popularity in Mexico is a little higher than it is here. We have time for, 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 for two questions, Margaret, and then Arturo. Sorry, we, we're, we're going to be tight on the questions. Margaret Hayes, um, I want to go to uh, the pick up on the last words that um, Sid said and, and Carlos comment that we are told that this you know, is not a good relationship when in fact the numbers show that it is a good relationship for the United States as well as for um, Mexico. And the question would be what, what do we now need to do to change the tenor of the discussion about the U.S.-Mexico relationship and NAFTA and turn that into a discussion <coughs> of the positive sum game that it has been. For example, 
Um, you mentioned the labor unions have been uh, outspoken, uh, and maybe the think tanks have followed their <laughs> lead, but the business community also has lost interest. Of all of the organizations that were extremely active during the run-up to NAFTA, uh, hardly any of these uh, breathe a breath anymore. Um, so do we need to kind of relaunch a, a, a new NAFTA following on a new start uh, in, in order to change the discussion of our, uh, of the relationship in a way that supports U.S. and Mexican competitiveness and focuses more on the investment and development opportunities that would enhance our global competitiveness? Yes, I think we need to do more. Carla, in a way, gave you some of that in her talk. She mentioned, she mentioned the fact uh, it's, it would be very difficult at this point in time in U.S. and in Mexican history to, to have a common external tariff, which would make a big difference. Uh, she gave one reason for my reasoning is, uh, is that it would, it would change a lot of the relationship. Instead of leaving, you know, we're now 15 years away from when NAFTA was signed. We signed a lot of other agreements. We did nothing to strengthen NAFTA. Uh, she suggested that we get rid of a lot of the rules of origin. I think we can in many, many ways, and the suggestions have been giving, push that further. I think it would make a big difference if the president spoke up a little bit. And secondly, I think it would make a big difference if the president, our president, Obama, whom I support, didn't cave to his labor supporters on every single issue. He caved to them on, on the trucking issue. Uh, and, and, and I've asked a lot of my friends in the trade business, can you think of any other single case where the United States consciously and deliberately violated an agreement it, it signed? And I've never gotten an answer, giving me a good example. We sometimes have, but it, was, it wasn't deliberate. It was sort of in fits of forgetfulness, and if we were called up on it, we changed. On that, we haven't changed. Uh, I'm sort of hoping that all of the industries that are losing their market in Mexico eventually have some influence, losing the market because of the uh, retaliation. In other words, I think there's no substitute for the President of the United States to indicate that he cares about Mexico, and he has not done that. Thank you, Arturo Porsegansky with American University. Uh, thank you, Sydney. I look forward to reading your book. Um, the relationship is indeed unequal, and I think uh, I, I sympathize with the idea that in order to even it out a bit, it's going to be mostly up to Mexico, either to pose a greater risk to the United States or to uh, become more of a land of opportunity to the United States. And that is what's going to take it to, to, to be put uh, on the radar screen and, and to even the relationship. On the risk side, you can just imagine, if it were to become true that Mexico, the situation deteriorates to the point where it is a th in threat of becoming a failed state, I'm sure it would get on everybody's radar screen much more than it is now. But it's not a failed state, despite some rumors to the contrary. And uh, that's why we, we, we take it quite seriously, the whole security situation and so on, but, but that's not enough to overcome other interests. On the opportunity side, to be uh, optimistic or unrealistic, if they were to open up the energy industry, I think that would put them on the map, because then you'd have the kind of corporate interests that could take on the union interest in this country and maybe something would, good would come out of that confrontation. But the, the, the fact is that the last two presidents in Mexico haven't been able to reform even lesser uh, uh, problems than that one. It seems to be mired in, in, in a lot of history and emotion and everything. 
do you agree with me, unless the energy sector is opened up, uh, that would be just about one of the few ways where the relationship could become less unequal. And I certainly would appreciate any other panelists comment too. No, I agree with what you're saying. I think the way you put it is very good. Uh, 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 if, they, if they started to become a failed state, the, the, we might give them a little bit more money, but I'm not sure what the full reaction of the United States would be of that. Uh, I don't know how you deal with narcotics. Otherwise, I think, as I point out in the book, that we put Mexico in a hopeless position when it comes to narcotics. We consume up here, uh, and then we deplore all the killings taking place because the various uh, uh, marketing groups down there fight for access to this big profitable market that's worth, I don't know how much to them, 20 billion, 30 billion, 40 billion. Uh, uh, we don't, we're not reacting quite the way you say we might react if it started to become a failed state. I don't know what would happen in that case. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, the fault begins up here. And it, it was useful. Imagine it took Hillary Clinton until when? This year? Last year? To even say that officially. Up till then, the fault was all theirs. And I, I never understood that because it was it was clear to everybody else except official, officials as to where the fault was. On your second point on energy, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the polls actually, the reason the president was not able to do anything, there are historical sensitivities. Every Mexican child who has been in school since 1938 has learned about how they they got a lot of their freedom back uh, by expropriating the oil properties. It's deeply embedded. When polls are taken, and maybe we ought to, it ought to get changed so that they, they can enter into joint ventures with other countries, uh, the overwhelming majority is against it. And that's one of the reasons it doesn't get through Congress. I've tried to think through what scenario, and it would be important, it would be critical, uh, uh, I've tried to think of a scenario under which that might happen. And I've done that by analogy to other scenarios where changes took place. Uh, the trade and investment scenario changed when there was no option. There was really no option. It had failed. Import substitution had run its course, it failed, and you had a, you had a a downturn in Mexico that lasted a whole decade. Uh, they changed their exchange rate uh, when it became clear that the failure to devalue had consequences, and, and they, they reacted to that. I've often thought the way things might change, production in Mexico of oil is declining. It's been declining for a number of years. Uh, they're still producing enough to do well, but unless they find some new oil and reverse the decline. Uh, and they, they're they even trying now to drill in deep waters, not very deep the way Brazil does, but deeper than they have. But let me make an assumption that they don't find new oil. Then, since they skim off about 40% of the federal budget from the gross revenues of Pemex, the National Oil Company, in order to be able to finance the federal budget. If Mexico were unable to export oil because the production had gone down, they need other money somewhere in their system to be able to finance the federal budget. The only other way I can think of is to raise taxes. Uh, and then if a choice came between raising taxes enough to finance the federal budget or doing nothing, I think the choice between raising taxes and allowing foreign investment, joint ventures, you don't have to privatize uh, Pemex, that it's harder to raise taxes. <laughs> and I think the, the solution might come if that continues for another few years. Uh, beyond that, I don't see the solution. Uh, in other words, I, Mexico takes these steps 
the ones I mentioned after a crisis. And I think it would take a crisis to change this. Back to panelists. Uh, any, any comments they may have? Antonio? And, and, and then Andrew? Uh, uh. Yes, um, I think that uh, to follow your uh, question, that paradoxically uh, the, the U.S. Uh, has taken uh, NAFTA for granted and Mexican businesses as well, precisely because what, of what Ambassador Hill said, because it has been very successful. It has promoted trade and it has promoted uh, uh, investment. And uh, business leaders on both sides of the border just you know, did their own thing. They did... Uh, uh, business, but I think that now we need to give it a, another impetus. There are worrying signs on, on the U.S. side about uh, creeping protectionism with initiatives such as Buy American. Uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, U.S. non-compliance uh, on trucking. So if, if you, you want to go beyond NAFTA, the first thing you have to do is first fulfill NAFTA, then go, uh, then go uh, beyond. So I think that that uh, there's certainly a, a, a call for action for business leaders on both sides of the uh, border. In terms of what governments uh, can do to move the agenda ahead, uh, I would uh, focus on, uh, on three issues. First of all, uh, regulations, which were also mentioned by Ambassador Hills. Uh, I work on day-to-day -day issues of the uh, U.S.-Mexico economic relationship, and rules of origin and, and different regulations are not, a, uh, not only a real headache, but they make it very difficult to take advantage of the complementarity of our economies. I can't understand, uh, underscore this enough. Secondly, border issues, border infrastructure. That's when security and trade come together. And everyone speaks about that. We've heard about the, the SPP for a number of years, but I think it's, it's time for the, you know, to, for the rubber to hit the ground, as they say, to have much more investment on state-of-the-art border infrastructure. If we don't do that, We'll have a lot of rules that say that you can export and import goods tariff-free, but you need roads and you need an efficient border to deal with that. And thirdly, on energy, I think that there's too much focus on hydrocarbons when we speak of energy. Uh, I think that there is a wide scope for uh, cooperation be between Mexico and the U.S. on energy, on things like renewables, wind energy, I understand that there's a high degree of complementarity between you know, the, the wind conditions of Baja California, the needs of uh, California to, uh, to generate uh, energy from renewable sources. So I would definitely push that. I wouldn't sort of uh, open the Pandora's box of, of uh, hydrocarbons. I would use other issues of the energy uh, relationship. Um, I think Arturo's uh, comment is extremely well taken, which is, and, and I think it goes to the heart of, of the book as well. I mean, if there, there is sort of a takeaway from this book for me. It is that to some extent the onus for change in the relationship is on Mexico, but also the agency in the relationship is, is Mexico's. Um, and, and so you could either take that well or not on the other side of the border, but I, th I think in the end it is a story about the fact that Mexico is sort of controls its own destiny to some extent in this relationship. But it's either, you know, things go down the tubes and it becomes a national security crisis, or, you know, you do what India's done, which is, you know, India is, a, is in many ways a poorer country than Mexico, certainly less linked to the U.S. economy in many ways. This is a larger country. Other global issues play in. But, but it's created a buzz around, around its economy that Mexico has it, and so the opportunities also are there to do that. And, on, on Margaret's point, I think on the other side there is something, however, you know that that the U.S. can do, U.S. policymakers can do in the short term, and we're going to see what happens with the state visit that that the Mexico's president is making to to Washington in May, whether this happens or not. But think of this as a strategic partnership. I mean, at, at most in the U.S. policy system, people can think of one big issue at a time with regards to one country. I mean, we, we're fairly a fairly simplistic country when it when it gets down to it on that. Um, but, but to the extent we can take that one issue, and right now it is drug trafficking and security, and use it as a moment, as a key moment to think about the other issues. In the, I mean, can we talk about renewables? Because there's some exciting stuff in renewables that could be done right now. Um, can we talk about some uh, trucking and, and at least you know, some sort of moderate approach? And there's some possibilities there. And some of the other trade barriers. Can we talk about border infrastructure? Can we talk about global issues that Mexico and the U.S. are? And I think we should look on May 19th, May 20th. I mean, do, you know, to what extent do these other issues come out? Or do we simply have one note with Mexico? And right now it's security, and that's all we can think about. Um, I'd like to think, and, and hearing from people in the administration, I think there's a good chance that we're going to hear more than just security, that we're going to hear 
the beginnings of a discussion of a strategic partnership of these broader set of issues, in which security will be dominant, but there will be other things there. And, and I think we can hope in the long term that, that Mexico will begin to push some of those other issues and, and find some exciting new things to catch people's attention, not, not only in the U.S., in Latin America and around the world. Boy, I, I, you know, I hope Andrew's right. That, uh, uh, but I must uh, admit that my sense is that the U.S. tends to go back and forth with dealing with international problems or has two choices. One is cooperating with... Uh, other countries, or it's trying to build fences and keep uh, the problems that are created in the rest of the world out. And it seems to me that there was a tendency, even before the economic uh, crisis worldwide, that the U.S. was very U.S. population, the mood in the U.S. was anti-globalization, anti-international cooperation. We saw that with polls on trade. We saw that. Uh, when the U.S. rejected in, in, uh, investment from overseas. We saw that in just enormous number of ways about the sort of the way to deal with this sort of, uh, uh, sort of anxiety in the American population was not sort of to find the cooperation with the rest of the world, but to fence out the problems. And the problem is that Mexico or the, the, is, is so, as Sid said, dependent on the U.S. that when we fence out the rest of the world, we fence out Mexico, Mexico really gets hit very, very hard by that kind of attitude. And on the other hand, it can benefit a great deal from the cooperation. But I don't see that progressing for many of the reasons we've heard here. I and mean, the reason that the Obama administration is not giving the attention to Mexico is that it just doesn't matter that much to, and he has, there's a whole set of other problems, anxieties, challenges that he faces, and that Mexico is just very low on that list. And uh, that's where I liked your formulation, uh, you know. It takes great risk or great opportunity to move the United States. And, and when you say great, it's not just uh, sort of that means very, very large because the U.S. faces enormous risks already and enormous opportunities in many places. And so it really has to be, uh, you know, really uh, beyond what, you know, it's, it's not just great, it's, you know, super great risk or super great opportunity to move <coughs> the United States at this point. Thanks, Peter. Sydney, last word. I just want to make two brief points quickly. I never answered my, uh, Margaret's question, I realize, about business. If Obama were to speak up, the business would speak up. The reason they're not doing it is they don't expect anything. They don't expect support from the government or from the Congress, and they don't want to push against a, a rope because they would rather have some help. And the second point, and maybe one of the reasons I wrote the book is that, in my view, the U.S.-Mexican relationship is, other than on issues of war and peace, where it doesn't come in, I think is the most important relationship the United States has. We have a long border. Problems that originate there come up here. Uh, when they had the financial collapse, uh, the United States reacted. They reacted because they thought U.S. banks would fall. We reacted uh, earlier. Uh, we made a $50 billion uh, loan to, to help uh, pay off the Tesomono. Uh, I mean, we do things for Mexico at a critical moment, and we could avoid those critical moments if, in fact, the president fully understood that it does matter. It matters what happens there matters more on issues of war and peace than it happened what happens in any other country in the world. I mean, we, we go crazy. Our stock market, when the Greek economy you know, looks like it's going to collapse, but Greece is a, is a trivial thing for the U.S. economy and the U.S. political scene compared to Mexico, and I, and I wish the president would recognize that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sydney's book, I think, underscores the centrality of the relationship of Mexico to the U.S. There's lots to, lots to be thinking about as we go forward. I'd like to thank our, our three distinguished panelists. Uh, 
and uh, their predecessors uh, for making an introductory remarks. Thanks, Sid, very much for, uh, for sharing his thoughts with us, and thank all of you for having come. Uh, it's been a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting session. I think you'll find the book extremely interesting if you haven't read it, and if you would like to get your copy signed by Sidney, he is here for that. Thank you all very much. <laughs>